Scholars, what I'd like to do now, I'm getting a little out of sequence, but I think it'll be the best way to get us back into sequence, is I want to show you a whole bunch of pictures. So, yeah, and I know it'd be very hard to get back to lecturing. I've, I've lost you after something pretty interesting happening this morning. You're not really going to listen to me lecture anyway. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of pictures, and probably before the end of the hour is out, maybe I'll do a little lecturing, but, but it won't be a huge amount today. I, was, um, I had the privilege of being in some of these spaces a couple years ago with the uh, Moody Study Abroad uh, tours, which are really amazing things. I've been to Europe a bunch of times, have been consistently impressed with the study abroad opportunities that Moody has, so that's a little word for Dr. Quiggle's study abroad programs. If any of you do have the opportunity to participate in those, um, people have been very pleased with them and they've been good experiences. But let me show you a few slides of the actual cities where the, these folks were uh, working. And I'm going to show you both slides from the, the German Reformation, from Luther's day in Luther's cities, and I'm also going to show you some from the French Reformation, the Reformed Reformation with John Calvin. We're going to start, for no particular reason, but it works well for today, uh, given that we were just discussing John Calvin. Let's go to Geneva. <clears throat> On this tiny little screen, 60 feet away from you. Okay. <laughs> so here's the church where John Calvin was minister. Um, What's very interesting to note, I think, when you actually start looking at the, the historical spaces where the Reformation played out, is you get a better sense of what the Reformation was. We have 500 years of clarity now to look back on this movement, almost, and so we, we see it in very clear terms, and we forget that for, for a large amount uh, the first several decades of this movement, it would have been very confusing to people what even was happening would have taken someone most of, uh, most of the first half of their life, if they were born about the beginning of what we call the Reformation, it would take them probably till their 30s or 40s to even figure out that there was a Reformation happening, or at least to conceptualize it as the church is dividing. We're going to have a state church that's not the Roman church. Some, even to conceive, it, conceive of it in those basic terms would, take, would have taken decades. It's, the Reformation begins when again, class? 1517, October the 31st. It's not going to be until 1540 at a diet at Regensburg that it's going to be clear that there's not going to be a reunification of these, uh, the churches in the lands of these protesting lords and, and uh, the, other, the other church, the Catholic church. So when we come to Geneva, we're looking at a church that had been built as a Roman Catholic cathedral. What else would it have been? Um, and I think it's fascinating to just look at the eclecticism of the architecture here. As we look at the face of the church here, it looks a little bit like a Grecian temple, actually, with these uh, classic pillars. It looks like kind of the profile that you'd see if you were looking at the Parthenon in Athens or something like that. Then over to the side, we have this brilliant Gothic spire that just shoots up towards heaven in the very middle of it. And then this tower here to the right side is Romanesque. What do I mean when I say it's a Romanesque tower? It's, uh, feel this, okay, so just, if you, uh, if you just look at these images and sort of feel their weight as it were, look at how heavy the Romanesque tower is. That thing must weigh tons and tons and you feel it just when you look at it. Look at the thickness of the walls, the smallness of the windows. <clears throat> Not a whole lot of light's gonna be pouring through those windows. Um, the, the, the buttresses are, are impressive just from the visual, uh, the, the visual of it. This spire, on the other hand, this Gothic spire shooting up towards heaven is meant to sort of reflect this ethereal, angelic light, uh, airiness to it. And it just um, um, springs heavenward. Now these are different styles. The Romanesque style is going to be stereotypically of an earlier era, 1000s, 1100s. That Gothic uh, style is not going to happen until later, 12 and 1300s and so on. The Grecian t style that we saw at the other end, of course, can be dated back to classical antiquity, 4th, 5th BC, century BC and probably earlier. So it's a very eclectic building that we're looking at. And this is, this is the building that uh, John Calvin was uh, a minister at and where the Reformation is taking place. This is kind of the center of it all. Now we enter the building and I'm sorry that, sorry you can't see more richly, but do tell me what you do see as we step into the building. What are your general impressions? What do you notice? Very tall ceiling, good. 
Those arch vaults that you see at the top of the ceiling, we can just see a little bit of it there, uh, would be characteristically Gothic. It again reflects th this uh, airiness. Yes, so very tall nave. What else do you notice? Good. Feels narrow. Okay, and that's that's going to be sort of part of the basilica structure. That that uh, that entryway that leads all the way to this very majestic presence at the front. That's going to be a consistent feature of basilicas, really even from the, the pre-Christian Roman basilica. Remember when Constantine appeals to this architectural type, which was then a, a essentially a political courthouse, you're meant to have this feeling of awe as you walk into uh, where the judge would be sitting. So that, that's a consistent feature of these Christian churches. Matthew, what do you notice? Um, Okay, good. Actually, that's quite surprising. Yes, there is an, an emptiness as well. And on top of the other true things that have been said about this church, there's sort of an emptiness. And that's going to reflect the, the iconoclasm of, the, of the, uh, the Reformation, and especially the, the, the Genevan Reformation. Now, I'll take you in a few moments. In time, we'll get to Calvin's church, and it's going to look, or excuse me, Luther's church, and it will look very, very different. Luther's church is going to be um, full of paintings and full of rich decoration. So that, that is indeed a surprising factor. Now, <clears throat> we come to the pulpit. That's a pretty magnificent pulpit we've got there. Um, the, the pulpit is pretty ornate, and I, I don't actually know when that pulpit dates to. Um, I, I, I'm sure it dates from Reformation times, but I'm not sure how much it might antedate uh, or come before Reformation time in the 16th century. So one of the things that is not removed from the church, individual pieces of work, uh, of art, statuary, and paintings, and things like that are brought out of this church in Geneva when Calvin, Calvin's Reformation really gets going. But a grand piece of uh, what we think of that might be art, certainly is artistically and done with very careful craftsmanship, the execution of this pulpit, that's not removed. They don't carry that off and burn it or something like that. And I suppose that's also appropriate. The, the word of God is what becomes central in this Genevan Reformation. So it's appropriate too that the preaching of the word be done from this really magnificent pulpit. There you go. You can see what songs they were singing on that board last week. I took these pictures maybe two or three years ago, I think. <clears throat> Good. Now, again, that's the pulpit in main view there, but as you look up past the pulpit, you should see those archways way up top in the, in the uh, this is going to be out on the transept. You should be able to see those empty archways. When this was a, in pre-Reformation days, when this was just a standard Catholic church, there would have been statuary in all of those those um, archways. So you would have seen statues of the saints and all of those. And now they're just empty. There's really not much else to put in there. Good. This is the choir. And probably for the same reasons that the pulpit is not taken out, um, the choir do, is not taken out and does have uh, um, depictions of the saints on it. So it's a preservation, a little bit of a preservation of this pre-Reformation time when, um, of course, you want to fill the eyes of the parishioners with the view of the, the saints, so for inspiration and, and so on. And so this choir uh, reflects that earlier period as well. <clears throat> There's a very modern organ. I hope you can see that relatively well. There's a very modern organ right back there in front of the rose window. So it's in its modern form. Of course, music is a, is a glorious thing in this church. There's the rose window, and I shot at the rose window. <clears throat> and I thought this was pretty cool. This is the International Museum of the Reformation. Some of the, um, some of the artifacts that Karen Ma Karine Mogg has in the, the Meters Center actually would rival the collection that they have here as well. Uh, they have some really amazing things, first edition Calvin's Institutes and some other things at the Meter Center in Grand Rapids. But this is another center. If you uh, look around the globe for top centers of, of artifacts pertaining to Calvin, this would certainly be one of them. Um, and, I, and then also in Seoul, Korea, Calvin, Calvin's Reformation has done really, really well in Korea with uh, Korean Presbyterians. So actually Seoul. Uh, Korea, South Korea is now one of the best places to also do Calvin research. Here we can see Calvin 
uh, pointing with his, with his beard to go around the corner to his museum. I think that's pretty cool. <clears throat> it's not necessarily the, the first way I would have imagined Kelvin, but yeah, Dr. Manich has encouraged us to think of Kelvin as a little bit more friendly than perhaps we have. Uh, going, out to the, going out towards the sea, <clears throat> we have here the City of Refuge, um, and this is just uh, a, a relatively early remembrance of the way that so many refugees did come uh, to Geneva and could practice uh, Reformation, Reformation Christianity while they were there. Out there in the, um, out there in the, the harbor, one of the standard modern uh, images or symbols of Geneva is this beautiful fountain. I think it shoots water up to like 130 feet, something like that. So it's a very high-powered fountain out in the, the bay. And if you tour Geneva by Google Earth, they have a wonderful depiction, a graphic depiction of this fountain as well. So it's definitely one of the symbols of modern Geneva. Good. This is, this is uh, moving out from Kelvin's, Kelvin's Geneva. This is the epicenter of the Genevan uh, uh, or the Calvinist tradition. Let me take you now to Zurich. This was a shot that I took out from my window when I was with the, the uh, Moody Study Abroad tour. That was pretty fun. And then see those mountains way back there? That, it, we went up those mountains. We saw North Face. The, the mountain after which the North Face clothing brand is named and all kinds of cool stuff. We saw the original village, which was the inspiration for J.R. Tolkien's Rivendell. It was a pretty fun day. That's a day I'd like to live over and over again. Is that what they say in Grand Day? Okay, anyway. Uh, Zurich. Let's head on to Zurich. This, who's, what are the reformers is going to, to be uh, operating and working in Zurich? I'm sorry? Zwingli, excellent. So uh, this is down by the river in the main center of the city. I only have a few uh, pictures here. I believe, okay, the, the Frauenkirche, so the, the St. Mary's Church at the center of town is a, is a wonderful place to visit, but I forget why I don't have pictures. I don't think pictures are allowed in the church, and so I don't have any pictures of that church. But here is a statue of Zwingli. Um, we, when we get to Zwingli, probably next week, but pretty soon here, we'll understand why he's carrying a sword. One of the things that Zwingli was preaching against was mercenarism. So um, these uh, young, strapping um, Swiss lads selling themselves off to mercenary work or going uh, and fighting in, in battles for other countries. Switzerland has been sort of this neutral space for a very, very long period of time, and so their, their young people weren't really concerning themselves with local wars, but they'd go off to other people's wars and fight for them. And uh, Zwingli's quite against this practice. So it's, it's uh, bringing lots of their young people home maimed, but it's also just not a very Christian thing to do. So he's very much against this mercenaryism. He, however, dies himself in battle. So he's carrying a sword there uh, as memory of those things. <clears throat> Here you have his dates. I believe he died as a very young man, only in his 30s. And here, for those of you who might, um, might know Dr. McDuffie, he teaches Christianity and Western culture in Chicago. He's there in the center giving an enrapturing lesson there about how the Anabaptists were uh, um, drowned in the river that we see in the very back. So this is sort of a bitter part of the story. Anabaptists, you remember those who were uh, um, practicing rebaptism, not accepting as valid the, the baptism that they had received as children. And the city, uh, city council was very much against this, and they actually had some of the Anabaptist leaders drowned right out in the view that you see there. There is a snapshot of the Frauenkirche, St. Mary's Church. You can see the spire there. It's an, an, amazing, an amazing tour. Pictures, I believe, were not allowed, and hence I don't have any. That's Calvin's Geneva and a little bit of the Swiss Reformation there, a couple shots we were able to gather from Zurich. Let's go ahead and, and go to Wittenberg. Wittenberg is going to bring us back to Luther. Whenever I resume lecturing to you, I'll start, I'll start back in Wittenberg and with the, the German Reformation. And when we, when we come here and just look at the, the, the churches and some of the art here in town, we're going to get a very different feel. We're going to understand immediately some of the differences here between the French Reformation, the French and Swiss Reformation, uh, and the Reformed tradition, and the Lutheran tradition that grows up here in, in Wittenberg in northern Germany. We're standing here now at the city square. This is St. Mary's Church, of course, uh, before Reformation days. This is a Roman Catholic church. We have no other way to describe this 
church, except that it's a Roman Catholic church at this time. This is the city square. Down in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see some relatively modern uh, um, statues dedicated to Luther and Melanchthon, who both worked in this, uh, this little university town, Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon. And if we were to turn, if only we had a virtual reality camera, if we were to turn here to the right, we would be able to see the print shop of uh, Lucas Cranach. Now, we'll introduce him in time, too, but Lucas Cranach is the most wealthy person here in Wittenberg. Um, he runs a, 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 an artistic studio here. This is also right off, if we could turn to the right and look here at Lucas Cranach's uh, studio, where he was employing about a dozen people. Um, if we could go in there and tour that, we'd also find that Luther's Bible is printed in this, in this place. Now, uh, uh, Wittenberg is a very small city. If we just took a couple blocks down this main drag here, we'd be at where the university is. And if we went back about a block and a half or two, two blocks, we'd be to the, the uh, castle church where Luther tacked up the 95 theses on the, on the church door. So this is a very small space. Um, by the time you've walked one end of the city to the other, you've crossed about six opportunities for espresso and ice cream. And that's about all there is to, there at this little city. I think most of the ice cream vendors came in after Luther's day. Here we are in St. Mary's, so let's enter the, the church there that you see with the two towers. This is the pulpit, and I was very glad that I was able to get these, these pictures a couple years ago because in the intermediary time for about the last couple, several years, uh, the church has been totally covered in scaffolding. It looks like somebody did some sort of really weird artistic experiment. Um, the whole place is, is uh, papal, uh, got saran wrap just everywhere, construction wrap everywhere, um, because they're getting everything just as, as pristine as they possibly can in time for the 2017 celebration of the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation. Here's the pulpit where Martin Luther would have preached himself. <clears throat> And I'm going to take you to an, a picture in the back of the church. First of all, the, the most simple observation that I want you to note is that there are pictures. There are lots of pictures in this church. And, and that is going to be quite different than the iconoclast tradition that develops up in Geneva, where um, images are going to be pulled out and, in some cases, many cases, destroyed. I, the, the Lutheran tradition, then, in this regard, is much more traditional. We can look at the Reformation as a spectrum. It begins here in German territory in Wittenberg with Martin Luther, and some reforms are made, but the, the Swiss Reformation and the, the French uh, Reformed Reformation are going to be much more drastic, especially, and that will be especially obvious in their treatment of art. Here we are looking at a picture. I know that it's glared over so you can't see it perfectly well, but in the center of the picture, do you see that man with a black robe who has some sort of stick in his hand. Let's go get a closer look. That's Martin Luther. And it's, it's really, I find it very interesting, I find it fascinating that we have a pretty good depiction throughout the lifetime of Martin Luther, what he looks like, because there's at least a dozen careful portraits that are made of him by professional artists during his day. So we, we know what Martin Luther looks like at different periods of time. And here we see him as an older man, his hair uh, completely white, and he's got a nice full figure there. And, um, and uh, his face is rather full as well. Yes. M Martin Luther, it's interesting. We'll see some of these earlier depictions of him too. He starts out as this skinny little thing. And it's because he's quite dedicated to fasting and whatnot. And he's a good monk. And as time goes on, his figure does what many of ours does. It kind of... <laughs> In Martin Luther, it's especially noticeable. I think he, had, he fasted quite severely during his younger years and sort of did some sort of internal damage to his intestines. And so his health, his, uh, his stomach health was not brilliant and he did uh, pleasantly become round. Now, what is Martin Luther doing there? <clears throat> what is Martin Luther doing? Go ahead, please, Ben. Oh, what an interesting interpretation. Uh, must be evidence of the fact that these pictures are too small. <laughs> uh, that would be a great idea, right. Um, well, actually, he's raking, but he's working his tail off. Look at how hard he's working. You can almost imagine the sweat on this man's brow. He's working really hard. Uh, what do you see over here? 
Can you see what's happening? I'm sorry? Who is this man with this richly decorated red and, or, and, uh, and green drapery and this, this wonderful miter that he's got on his hat, on his head? Probably, yes. We, we assume that this is, uh, the, actually I think the Pope is down below. So I think this is a high cardinal or something along, the, not a cardinal, they would wear different hats. The cardinal there you see in the background with the red who's carrying the sheaf there. That would have been a cardinal. I'm not sure if this is some sort of archbishop or who this man is with the mitre. Probably there's a specific historical interpretation that I'm not aware of. But he's a, he's a church official. And what is he doing? He's, he's got a little bonfire that's going in the middle of this vineyard. Wait a minute, that can't possibly be the right thing to do there. Uh, and who is aiding him there, as you see sort of the, the just left of, or right of center you see there, you see some sort of faithful monk, tonsured there, wearing a monk's robe, and he's throwing in uh, um, uh, grapes into the fire. What are they doing? Now down here below, uh, this probably is the Pope, I would imagine, and you have quite a train of ecclesiastical officials and monks and all of these folks following, and they, now you can sort of see it. Those, uh, the ecclesiastical officials there are all on the left-hand side. And do you see how in the center of the, in the very center of the uh, image, there's a, a line that drops down through the whole uh, scene. It's dividing up this vineyard into two sections. <clears throat> Perhaps it would be possible to drop the lights. I wonder if that would help bring out some of the colors. I don't, I don't need any light up here. Thank you. So you see all the, the church officials there on the left, and what are they doing? They're burning the vineyard. And on the right, you see Martin Luther and his very plainly dressed, um, they're dressed in simply white and black, thank you so much for that, uh, um, figures there as, as they're also in a reverent position. They're kneeling there. They have their hands folded, probably in prayer or worship. You see the, the small children gathered around them as well. They, they almost look like Puritans. And there they are working their tails off in, in Christ's vineyard uh, to the right-hand side. What's the obvious meaning of this picture? We can't miss it, can we? If you're a peasant in, in Wittenberg during the, the 16th century and you come in and look at this, you're going to know what's happening. You're going to know that Martin Luther is the good guy and he's being faithful in the Lord's vineyard and that it's these villainous church officials who are just burning the whole place up. Right. The, uh, I find it very interesting um, the way that art is deployed for theological ends in the Reformation. I remember it was about two years ago. I was with my father-in-law who's, who's an artist, uh, uh, who's an art buff. He gives uh, tours of Nuremberg and things like this and c the cathedrals in Nuremberg. And um, I, he took us out to Coburg, which is, uh, uh, my mother-in-law wanted to go there. It was her birthday celebration. She had a thing for Queen Elizabeth. So there's some Queen Elizabeth stuff there as well. We were visiting that. But, but uh, father-in-law was very interested in it for the Martin Luther stuff that was also there at this uh, um, castle in Coburg. And they happened to have this exhibition of art that had been used, really cartoons that had been used to make theological points during the Reformation. And that comes with the printing press, right? When you can produce uh, cheap reproductions uh, on paper, you can do visuals or, or print or text media quite easily. And so a lot of cartoons were printed, we would look at them back as now as propaganda, but they were used to make points during the Reformation. I remember seeing some, some very crass things there too like a Reformation depiction of, of um, a man, you know, a Catholic priest giving out the host to people. And, you know, you see these like demons whispering in the ears of the people. What would you see if you, what would you think if you saw that as a, as a medieval peasant? Oh, my, that's quite spooky. If I partake in the host uh, from a Catholic church, am I, you know, are there demons in the room or something like this? Is this witchcraft? That'd be very scary, wouldn't it? Right? You see some things that are really, disgusting, but I think uh, it's interesting for your education. Some cartoons, for example, of um, the Pope giving some directions and there's like a demon pooping on him, you know, <laughs> which is a very clear message and, and sort of a, uh, 
Well, I don't know. There's no holds barred. These people are making all kinds of graphic depictions to sway people's opinions about what's happening during these Reformation periods. Cartoons were actually used to tremendous benefit. Here we have a more serious appropriation of art, but nonetheless one with a very pointed message. Now this is the famous altar piece at uh, at the church in Wittenberg. There's four panels to it. You can see three, at, uh, three on top and one down below. And uh, these, this altarpiece was finished, I believe, just months before Martin Luther's death in 1546. This was, this was a very difficult time for the Lutheran movement. Um, they had lost, Lutheran princes had lost some very significant battles in the early 1540s, and Martin Luther was on his deathbed, who was this charismatic leader of the whole movement. So in the 1540s, and this was only after a couple years after the 1540 Regensburg Diet, Diet at Regensburg, which it was announced that the Lutheran Church is not going to be able to re-come back uh, and join with, with uh, Roman Catholicism in any way. That was politically impossible. So the Lutheran movement is in a very precarious position, and there's a lot of courage that comes straight through, a lot of uh, theological boldness, a lot of self, uh, um, clear orientation, clear theological orientation that comes through on this altarpiece. You can see possibly there down in the left, uh, bottom right-hand corner, excuse me, at the, the cross of the three images coming together, you see the AD 1546, uh, uh, I believe it is. <coughs> excuse me. Okay, well, oh, actually 1547, so you see the two dates there, 1547 on the left-hand side, 1928 when it was refurbished on the right-hand side. The first image down below, what is it that we, when we look at, at the altar here at the church in Wittenberg, what do we see? What is it you're looking at? Good, it's the crucifixion scene. Is this a historical scene? What is this? It's a sermon, exactly. Let me get in a little closer. That's our friend Martin Luther again. Now the clock wound back about 15 years or so and his hair is only salt and pepper. And he's uh, about 30 pounds lighter. Uh huh. What's happening? Luther's preaching. By the way, if you see in, in medieval art, or really earlier art, it develops in earlier art iconography, but it carries on through medieval art into early Renaissance art as well. If you see somebody holding up two fingers like this, they're probably speaking. Luther is very clearly the one who's addressing, and there's even some motion to his hand, so he's probably speaking vigorously in this image. What is it that he's talking about? Just give me your thoughts. Was turning off the lights a bad idea? <laughs> Go ahead. Very clearly, thank you, Matthew. Right. Uh, it's almost as though Jesus manifests or, or comes to the vision of the people as Luther is preaching. Of course, this is not a historical scene. I love it because it's almost surrealistic. Do you know what surrealism is, right? Surrealism, um, it's uh, Dali, Salvador Dali and so on, or some of the, the major figures of this movement. But what does surrealism do? It relies on juxtaposition, right? You make a message by, by sort of making this pastiche of these other elements and just sticking them together and usually leaving the, uh, the viewer uh, totally confounded. You know, you have this train flying into a fireplace or something like that to use one of Dolly's famous images. Uh, it's almost surrealistic. There's an eeriness to it. Christ crucified in the center of the room, but he's clear, this is clearly not a historical depiction of the crucifixion. He's in the middle of this, uh, this contemporary building. And look at the way his drapery is just kind of flying around in the scene. It's almost like he's in water. It's, it's, there's a, there's a, uh, a, a, an unnatural unfolding of the event. It's, it's a vision or an apparition. It's when the message is very clearly when Luther is preaching, Jesus is filling the vision. The crucified Christ is filling the vision of the people who are onlooking. And you can see the faithful there to the, to the left listening to this message, and what are they contemplating? They're contemplating the death of Christ, his atoning work. Good, good. Okay, now we're going to move up on the altarpiece to the three images above, and let's see what we find there. Here's to the leftmost image. What is it 
that you see. Please, Joel. Uh, Excellent. Yes, there's a baptism of a baby. Uh, um, the man administering the baptism, that must be Melanchthon. There up at the top. Good. So, um, if any of you remain yet to be surprised that the Reformers practiced infant baptism, now's a great time to get that surprise out of the way, <laughs> right? During the Reformation, until the Anabaptist movement, they're all practicing uh, uh, infant baptism. Good. Now, the center panel, what are we looking at? What's happening? Somebody say it. Somebody said the Lord's Supper and that's what we're hoping for. Good, yes, a nice round table. I saw a cartoon recently of Jesus coming into a restaurant and saying, table for 26, please. <laughs> and the maitre d' says, did I already sell this? <laughs> maitre d' says, but there's only 13 of you. And Jesus says, well, but we're only going to sit on one side of the table. Yes. <laughs> I'm, from some of your faces, oh no, I'm having this terrible moment thinking that you may have heard that before. I'm so sorry. Uh, nice round table. This is un, unusual in Renaissance style. Usually exactly you get the sort of the one-sided approach to the, the uh, table in the upper room. So this is sort of a creative depiction of that. Jesus, you can see at the left, and he has the young disciple John resting on his bosom there, as you can see, according to the text. Uh, uh, this man here in the orange, you can see, oh, my cursor doesn't show up. Mostly on the left-hand side, left of center, you see Judas there sitting quite uh, indignantly. He's got the money bag there in his left hand, and he's uh, sort of glaring at Jesus, if you can get closer to the image. Good. All right. Um, and, you, and I think it's very interesting also to look at these folks and note that they're in Renaissance garb. There's, there's no particular attempt to display these people as they would have actually looked in history. Now, on the altarpiece, we have, so far, we have a depiction of baptism and the Lord's Supper, or of course, standing for you, the Eucharist. What's very surprising as we look at this altarpiece is that there aren't just two panels. There's a third panel, and the first two have symbolized sacraments. What's this third panel doing? Who can help me out? Be bold. Go for it. What, what is it that we're looking at? Please? Looks like there's a man with a can down and then I think in the name of the Eucharist. Good. Yes, it's Johannes Hugenhagen, uh, Bugenhagen, excuse me, who was parish minister there at St. Mary's in Luther's day. Yep, and, and the man's hands are bound. That's a great detail to be noticing. What else do you see there in the image? Can you see, and I, I don't know if you can or not, but in, in Bugenhagen's hands there, you see the two keys that he's holding. What could this possibly symbolize? Thank you, Joel. Anybody? Be bold, Samson, shoot. It's not a bad guess. It's not a bad guess. Please. Yes. No, you're on the right track. Right, exactly. The, the, the tradition of the Lord that he gives the keys to Peter and says what, is bound, what you bind here on earth will be bound in heaven and what you loose here on earth will be loosed in heaven. So this image is a depiction of Confession, essentially. The, the man whose hands are bound there is probably confessing sin. You see another man um, um, kneeling there by Bugenhagen, presumably confessing sin as well. And Bugenhagen, as priest there, is, is absolving or not absolving these people who are confessing their sins. Right, it's a symbol of confession. And what, what is very interesting there, I'll, I'll back out so you can see the whole altarpiece there, uh, as, as you see it as you approach the the... the uh, altar in, in, in um, the church there in Wittenberg, St. Mary's Church. What's very interesting to, to note then is this visual depiction of the importance of confession in the Lutheran tradition. So Luther, as far as I know, waffles a little bit on this question of whether confession is a sacrament for the church. Um, in his earlier years, it seems that 
confession operates as a sacrament. Of course, how many sacraments are there in the, in the Roman Catholic Church following the Lateran Council 4 in 1215? It's at 1215 that the Roman Catholic Church pronounces how many sacraments? Seven. There are seven sacraments. And confession is one of those, along with baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Lutheran tradition in its early form holds on to three. Later, it seems that Luther really only holds to two sacraments, but even this altarpiece that's done very shortly after Luther's uh, life contains that reference back to confession is very, very important. All right, let's move on to the so-called Castle Church, which is the church where Martin Luther uh, tacked his 95 theses. What's the best known um, uh, hymn that Luther composed? What do you think? Yeah. At least for us, I would assume that's the best known. A mighty fortress is our God. And, and uh, even there around the rim of the castle church, you can see Ein Festa book with the beginning of a, a mighty fortress. Uh, um, and of course, it was this, this castle church that inspired that hymn as um, Luther was walking past this tower every day on his way out to class and whatever other duties he had in the church community there, he was reflecting on God as fortress. Back in Luther's time, there was two towers. <clears throat> Only one has been rebuilt. Neither of them are, are original to Luther's day, but this castle, it was, there were two turrets, you see, and they were connected to city walls. One here um, has been re restored and is right next to the church. I'm taking this picture from the uh, hostel window um, where actually the Moody Study Abroad group, uh, I believe, continues to stay when they're there in Wittenberg. Food's not so good, but it's, you know, a great view. All right, here we are looking at the castle church. And down here below is the very famous door where Luther texts these 95 theses on Reformation Day. Uh, the doors, the original doors don't exist. They were wooden doors. And you probably know that Luther was not trying to do something outrageous by tacking up his uh, theses up on the church door. That would be quite outrageous if you, you know, took a nail gun and put some... Uh, uh, you know, your paper up on John McMath's door or something like that. But that's not what's happening here. This is a pretty standard way of making a public announcement. The doors have, are no longer, have no longer survived, but they've been replaced with these beautiful bronze doors on which are written the original Latin of the 95 Theses. And so you can spend a lot of time there reading them if you care to <clears throat> when you visit Wittenberg. Up above the door, you see a, another depiction of Luther there at the left holding open a book. What could that possibly be? That must be his translation of the scriptures. And then to, on the right side of Jesus, who do you have there? Does anybody want to hazard a guess at who that, who that uh, slightly younger man could be? I'm sorry? Okay, good. Theodore Basil would be uh, sort of Calvin's right-hand man, as it were, or his sidekick. Uh, this is going to be Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon, who is a brilliant humanist. You know enough about humanism in the Renaissance to understand what that means. He's going to be a, a scholar in Renaissance tradition. He's going to be a, a brilliant um, Latinist and Greek scholar. And there he's holding the Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession uh, of 1530, you can even see the Roman numerals there on the book. The Augsburg Confession, when the Lutheran princes... So that is when the princes over various feudal territories in the Holy Roman Empire, when they break away from Rome and fealty to Rome, loyalty to Rome, when they break away from Rome and form their own coalition, they need some sort of doctrinal standard to unify them. And so Luther, uh, excuse me, Melanchthon becomes the main architect of the so-called Augsburg Confession, which is going to be the doctrinal standard of this early Reformed Lutheran movement and continue on, of course, to this day to be the Lutheran standard uh, of, um, of orthodoxy. Good. Let's go to Luther's house very quickly. And I, I think I, what we'll do here is I, I'm going to show you a couple more slides and then I will give you five minutes just to stretch your legs and open your eyes again and then we'll turn on the lights again. But stay with me just for a few more minutes. <clears throat> it's always dangerous to dim the lights. Somebody will be coming through the aisle and passing out... Um... Never mind. <laughs> I was going to say for those of you who need pillows, we'll come through the aisle and pass those out. Okay. On your way to Luther's house, as if this were an airline. 
Luther's house, we're going to move through here. Here's an inspirational saying that I think is brilliant and want to pass on to you because I hope you get something of this spirit. It says there in German, don't let anyone lose faith that God wants to do something great with him or her. And that's from Martin Luther. And this is what you see in the art. That's a, a quote that's been etched there in the archway as you come through. And look at Luther's house. Yep, that's it. I like to say that the Reformation did some people very well. <laughs> yeah, it looks like one of those English manors that Mr. Darcy would live in. What's going on? Okay, well, this was the Augustinian monastery in Wittenberg, and this is where Luther would have lived as a, a uh, somewhat tormented in soul uh, Augustinian monk. This is where he was when he was a scrawny little guy, uh, you know, very, very troubled about his soul and very conflicted about whether his sins were forgiven before God. Do you remember the story about Luther climbing up to the staircase and, and um, sort of this moment of spiritual crisis in his life? If that actually took place, it would have taken place in this tower. They even call that sometimes the tower experience. The tower is the stairwell in the house, or at this time it's a monastery. So that was this, you have simple open, a simple open floor plan throughout most of the rest of the building with monastery cells on either sides of the, the hallways. And it's a, I think it's a four story uh, building. And then this tower in the middle goes up. You can even see that the windows are slanted. That's reflecting the circular staircase that, that winds its way to the top. When I visited this uh, building for the very first time in my experience, it was 2003 and I was on my way to a, um, Oh, it was 2006, excuse me, and I was on my way to a conference in Berlin. Wittenberg is not very far off the, uh, the main railroad from the south to, the, to Berlin in the north, so I decided to make a layover here and see some of Luther's uh, artifacts. I was very glad I did. There was a, an elderly woman sitting on the bench there just at the bottom of the screen, and she said, hey, well, if you've never been here before, go over to the central doorway there and look underneath the column there, because there's an original depiction of Martin Luther from his own day, and because it's protected from the elements, it survived pretty well. So I said, thank you. Walked over there, peeked my head up underneath the column to look, and here's what I saw. Here's a, an early uh, sculpture depiction. It's, a, it's a, like a, a relief of uh, Luther there. Now, actually, we have lots and lots of good contemporary depictions of Luther, so this isn't necessary, but I found it an interesting artifact. Here is the... Uh, tower again before we head on into the building. Now the backstory here is that this was the monastery, the Augustinian monastery um, in Wittenberg at the time. Martin Luther was living there. The Johann uh, von Staupitz, who's going to be the head of the Augustinian order in Wittenberg, he and Frederick the Wise, who is the local prince, have been school kids together. So they know each other pretty well. Uh, Johannes von Staupitz makes a deal with Frederick the Wise. Frederick the Wise wants to start a university in this little town. So Frederick the Wise says he'll build the buildings if Johannes, Johann von Staupitz, who's the Augustinian head or the head of the Augustinian order in this area, if he would supply teachers. So this is also where the, the, uh, uh, many of those who were teaching at this young, newly founded university would have been living as well. And of course, for Luther, this is a very tumultuous time in his life. Now, when he marries, when the Reformation is going on and really gathers momentum, and Luther uh, marries um, uh, Katrin von Bora, Frederick the Wise, local ruler, gives this monastery as a wedding gift to Luther, and that becomes his house. There's no need for the Augustinian order anymore in this little Reformation town. We'll just give the place to Luther. And they do some really cool things with it. The Luthers are very... Um, um, very hospitable people. They had about 50 students living with them, and Catherine turned out to be some sort of administrative genius who uh, ran the place with tremendous uh, industry and vigor. She was a very, very sturdy woman. She was just a, a very, um, she must have had a huge soul. So Luther, Luther, of course, is a little bit, some have even asked themselves if Luther was bipolar. I'm not interested in speculating, and there's no way to know, but Luther did have sort of these tremendous mood swings. He would go through and become a very different person uh, depending on the, the time of the year, and he, he had tremendous variety of uh, 
you know, being totally distraught and downtrodden and just to complete ecstasy. He sort of went back and forth. Uh, Catherine von Bora seems to be the, the uh, stable one in the marriage, and she just ran this place like a tight ship, and she made the coolest, uh, the, uh, the city's best beer down in the basement of the building. If you go down there, you can still see these enormous vats where she was just brewing hundreds and hundreds of gallons of beer to keep these students going. <clears throat> yeah. I'm actually appreciative of Moody's stance on the issue. Don't take that the wrong way. Okay, here we go. This is, a, uh, this is an early depiction, a contemporary de depiction of the city of Wittenberg, and you can see what a small little place this is. In the, the far right of the, uh, far right on the side there, you see the two spires of St. Mary's Church, so the spires rose a little bit higher than they do now. And then on the left-hand side, that's the castle church. You have two spires back there, two, the, the two leftmost spires there, because those are the spires on top of the uh, castle turrets. We no longer have the leftmost turret that has been destroyed and never rebuilt, but the rightmost turret, the right turret there does uh, still exist. The spire's not as high as today either, but that's where, of course, Luther taxed the 95 Theses. This guy here is Frederick the Wise, <clears throat> this is the protector of Luther, and Luther's Reformation would have never got going, except that Frederick the Wise steps in and makes it a personal, he takes a personal interest in what's happening for political reasons, as well as uh, perhaps also for some reasons of, of genuine faith. That's God's business to know. This is Luther. Uh, an early depiction of Luther. By the way, the building that I showed you a few minutes ago, Luther's house, we're now inside of that building and it's been turned into a museum of the Reformation. And this is where the artifacts that I'm gonna uh, continue to describe for the remainder of our time are from. <clears throat> What's happening in this, in this print here? What do you see taking place? Shoot, please. Go ahead, Brad. Uh, is that the Luther on some kind of interval in July 1906? Good. Yes, okay, we have some conflicting imagery there. First of all, the, the, man, on the, um, the man on the donkey there is not Luther, although he looks like another late medieval Renaissance guy. And so they're similarly dressed and... and you can tell he has the tonsure. He has the tonsure of a monk. What's tonsure, folks? That's where a monk, right, would, would shave the middle of their head to be humble to, as a sh sign of humility. Try it. It's pretty humbling. Uh -huh. Good. So that's, but that's not Luther. Who is that? That's Tetzel. That's the, the man who will come into Wittenberg and start selling, selling indulgences and, and ultimately will spark the Reformation. The, if you look back at Luther's very earliest writings, he does have a theological agenda brewing before this more practical crisis erupts in Wittenberg over indulgences. Luther's earliest agenda, his earliest theological agenda is actually to do away with Aristotelian philosophy and its influence on scholastic theology. That's actually what Luther's burning agenda is, or desire to change in the church, uh, as as we get his very earliest writings. But this this issue of indulgences is perceived more as a pastoral uh, concern. Uh, Luther is quite put out that these indulgence preachers are coming through his hometown, where he also is minister, and soliciting for funds from his people, and really draining off the financial resources of the people. So here you have. Uh, a scene, Johann von, Tetz, uh, von Tetzel there, Johann Tetzel, excuse me, he's not a noble, is selling uh, an indulgence, and look at how official that is. It's got like six gold seals on it. Uh, um, and there's this big box here in the middle of the room where this eager person is coming up and throwing a large chunk of money in there, and he's even bringing one of his friends, uh, and, and there's an enthusiasm that you see in, in those people there on the left, and uh, they're buying indulgences. Now. I'm genuinely confused exactly what the symbolism of the birds above is. That would seem to be, I would have presumed that was a sign of 
holiness or the Holy Spirit or something like that, but given that it's an indulgent seller and this is from a Reformation point of view, that can't be the right interpretation. This must be a more ominous uh, presence behind Tetzel. And some of the other things that I want you to notice too is just look at how big that treasure chest is. Man, it would take like eight people to lift that thing once that's full of gold. And um, many will also comment on, well, how to say it, the asinine nature of this donkey so these long years, he almost looks demonic, and that's, that's purposeful. That donkey is meant to be sort of a, also an image of, of, or a sign, a symbol of sort of the evil of what's taking place. Good. Here is Luther as a younger man. Nice cheekbones like Cruella de Vil almost. He's, you know, fasted quite a bit. You could put uh, whoever it was that played Maleficent recently on a run for her money. Yeah. All right, Luther's 95 Theses. Let's actually look at this. Here is an early printing of the 95 Theses. The 95 Theses are these, and we'll go through them. We'll actually look at many of those in a, in a, in a class period, probably next class period. But the, it's a critique. It's a running critique that Luther is writing here of the practice of selling indulgences. It was originally published in Latin as an academic Exercise. Luther was trying to get some, some uh, folks together and have an academic debate, as would not have been uncommon. He was uh, running, as it were, an Athanasius lecture on, the, 90, on the, the practice of indulgences. That's sort of what he was doing for his community. Just let's get together people and talk about this and have a studied, a studied discourse about this. You can see that the first printing is in Latin, but within about three weeks, there's a German translation that has been printed and shot everywhere throughout the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Empire. excuse me. It's really remarkable what uh, print technology allows to happen at this time. This happens, it, it almost looks um, uh, completely coincidental or, or would have been impossible to predict, but here's just one moment when Luther writes something that just sparks this enormous debate that he could have had no idea what he was entering into. In the back of the building, the back of Luther's house, we have this section here, um, which is meant to be Luther's study. This seems to be where he did most of his commentary writing as well. <clears throat> There's a number of uh, first edition and early edition books that are preserved. Here's one that's open just with this gorgeous illumination. Um, and books, of course, are a huge part, an enormous part an inestimable part of what the Reformation is. This, is. this is what happens when Christian theology meets print media. You get the Reformation. What is it that I'm looking at here? It's a hymnal. Music, too, is an enormous part of this. Luther was uh, quite a hit, an accomplished hymnist and wrote a number of hymns. I guess, I'm not an expert here, but I understand that he was actually writing hymns in the style of the popular music of the day kind of the rock and roll of his own day, as it were, and um, which sounds nothing like rock and roll, folks, but he was writing in a popular style and, and has so many before him have, and after him, excuse me, so many after him have come under uh, scrutiny for doing so. There was, there was criticism that this was sort of a vulgar way of doing worship music. Um, uh, but history finally made its decision that that was to be the case. All right. Here is the Bible. Note that that's in a German type, uh, so these are old Gothic letters, and it says the Bible, that is the entire holy writing in German. And then it says from Martin Luther is the translator in Wittenberg. And the date there is 1534. So the entire Bible, not just the New Testament, which was completed in 1520, um, but the entire Bible there is now available for the Lutheran movement in the early 1530s. <clears throat> Here's Luther, a nice close-up of his face. You can see him uh, aging a little bit. His eyes look just a little bit more tired than they used to. He's done a lot of thinking in between. And here is a, people usually don't get this. That actually is the first response that most people, or a room full of folks will give, whoops, is uh, just sort of, Striked by, struck, struck by the oddity of this. What is this? Well, this is a, a painting of Luther after his death. And why is that important? Why would anyone immediately capture that? Um, well, this is a, it's important for these folks to know how it is that Luther died. 
because they, they anticipate that the peacefulness that you see there on Luther's faith, a face is a reflection that he was welcomed into heaven. He died peacefully, not in some sort of tormented way. For a medieval person, that's, that's important. It's a vindication of the rightness of his views. <clears throat> so the, the practice, not done so much today anymore, but the practice of preserving death masks, once somebody has died, to take an impression of their face in plaster, that used to be sort of a big deal. And interesting then for us as historians, we can look back and see what somebody looked like at the very end of their life. But uh, that's Luther's, the painting, immediately after he had deceased. Here is the amazing woman who made the Reformation actually possible, Catherine von Bora. And um, uh, Cranach in his studio did put together a number of portraits of Mrs. Luther as well. You know the story, right? I was so disappointed that the Luther film didn't make a bigger deal of it. Uh, all that you see in the Luther film right before their marriage is, is this uh, horse and buggy trotting forward and there's all these barrels in the back. Well, what's going on in that story? Do you remember that very, very famous story? Uh, the Reformation's been going on for a while and, and monasteries are starting to pop and these people who had been monks or nuns are reabsorbing them back into society. So you have a lot of marriages of former, of former ascetics taking place, which is, is a really unusual social experiment. Um, so you, yeah, these large communities of, of men and women who had given their lives to celibacy are now reintegrating themselves back into society. Uh, von Bora, Catherine von Bora was a nun who had, had vowed celibacy and her uh, convent is reabsorbing back into society too. This was of their free will. They were, they were not forced to do so, of course. But then, there, then, then those who were sort of running this Reformation movement are trying to find spouses for all these folks, in this case for this convent of women. And for whatever reason, uh, no suitable f suitor was found for Catherine von Bora. So if somebody puts it up, well, Luther, you're arranging all of these, or working in this movement that's getting all these people married. Why don't you marry her? Okay, so they got married. Uh, she was very much Luther's junior, I think by about 18 years. So I think the story is, is that Luther is in his, in his late 30s and that she's in her young 20s. Uh, and they marry and um, yeah, Luther got a pretty good deal here. Uh, she's, a very, she's a very stable person who I think empowered Luther to do what he was doing, who otherwise was quite an unstable person in some ways. Uh, they had six children together. Um, and, yep, and, and life was pretty good. Here's Luther. I'm not sure how I'd characterize that face. But anyway, this is the face of the Reformation. <laughs> Here's Luther's wife. Good. And she also, yeah, I've, I've mentioned her beer making activities. She was also... Um, she was also a very industrious person running kind of this community farm that was taking place out in her backyard too. So medieval life, we think of it as being totally uh, uh, free and unfettered from any sort of social requirements or something like that. Not at all. There was tons of red tape in med medieval communities. So you had to have a special license to raise goats back in this time. But, but Katerina von Bora's husband, Luther, had personal connections with the, the, the lord of the territory, Frederick the Wise, so they had all the license they, they needed, and they could, she raised goats and did all this other great stuff. And yeah, she had about 50 boarders with her, so it, the house was a monastery, so there's tons and tons of rooms in it. So they, they just transferred these cells, these monastic cells, into student living, and had about 50 students living with them. And, and Katerina von Bora oversaw the operation of actually feeding and taking care of these students. So that was an enormous endeavor. Um, you've heard of Luther's table talks, right? You've heard of that? That's after one of these huge meals, and they had this big old table where everybody's eating together. It would have been, I don't know how many dozens of feet long but literally seating 50 or 60 people. And after dinner, Luther and some of the students would go back into his study and just digest and talk. And so uh, what we have preserved from some of those conversations has come to us as the, quote, table talks. As you'd imagine, this is after Luther's had a good meal. Some of Luther's uh, most outrageous statements come out in these, in these times. <clears throat> Who's this villainous looking chap? Who is this? This is Thomas Munzer, who is ringleader of the Radical Reformation. Uh, 
Well, yes, but not to be confused with the Anabaptist Radical Reformation. Let me, let me uh, divide that up. Munster really is villainous to everybody, um, and I'll describe him a little bit to you later, probably in our next period, but um, he's, he's of hated memory, even during the 16th century and in this early depiction of him. Here's another early depiction of uh, Wittenberg. There you can see below, you can even see the lettering there, Das Schloss, that's the castle church on the far left. You've got the, um, uh, the St. Mary's Church in the middle. And then you've got, to the right-hand side, you've got these university buildings. You can see Philip Melanchthon's house, which is turning into a really nice museum too. If some of you go to Wittenberg, and I trust that, I actually I hope that many of you do, uh, if you have a chance during, during your college years or, your, or later years to go to Wittenberg, uh, Philip Melanchthon's museum. There is really a wonderful uh, museum to visit as well. There's another view of the castle church that we have. One last church, a view of the St. Mary's church in the middle of town. What is this that we're looking at? This is the papal bull where L Luther is threatened with excommunication. And you remember that he burns this papal bull publicly. So that's kind of drawing a line in the sand quite clearly. This is Andreas Karlstadt, I believe, who is a, uh, he's one of the, one of the positively remembered radical reformers. He's a, of an Anabaptist stripe, um, but not, uh, also a, a, a contemporary of Luther's. Their biographies are actually quite parallel. I'll share that with you next week. And then here is, uh, I think this is a, a, a more modern depiction. I think it's 1800s, sometimes in the 1800s it was painted, but a, a relatively modern depiction of the um, uh, Diet of Worms where Luther there is making his famous pronunciation that here I stand, I can do no other, God so help me, and that's Charles V sitting there with that uh, stereotypically very long face, that's Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor there. Um, it's just sort of a visual depiction of what's, what's taking place, the, the momentousness of what's taking place there with Luther's Reformation. Good, um, here's what I'd like to do, scholars. We have 15 minutes and I've not given you a second break. So I, what I'd like to do is take questions for about five to seven minutes and then release you just a couple minutes early in place of a second break. So if we could just have the lights back in the room, that would be wonderful. Let's dialogue just for a moment or two. If you'd be willing to shoot a couple questions that help summarize the, uh, the things that we've been able to look at, that'd be very helpful. And I'll dismiss you just a little early for your break. Go ahead, Joel. That's a great question. Okay, so Roman Catholicism, in a very real way, the reason why we call it Roman Catholicism is it's the religion that's, that's bequeathed to European civilization from the Roman emperor, uh, em Empire, excuse me, from Roman days. So you remember 380 Christianity and Catholic Christianity, that is uh, Trinitarian Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's where Roman Catholicism comes from. It comes from these imperial days. So now Christianity spread even further than Roman bounds in the, the medieval period too, up into the, the Scandinavian countries and, and the, the places where the Vikings had been very prominent as well. So I think we can say in a pretty, pretty comprehensive way, Europe was, this was Christendom. It was a European-wide uh, uh, religion. Europe-wide religion. Good. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Cassidy, Cassidy go for it. In light of the Reformation, I was wondering what your opinion is on the Yes, it is. Okay. Yep, good. It's the largest... Christian religion. I forget if Roman Catholicism alone would be larger or smaller than Islam worldwide. I don't know, but they would be comparable. They're pretty close to about the same size. Cassidy, let's see, would you, sh would you help me sharpen that question a little bit? I'm sorry, I can't yet address it. Like in light of the Reformation, I suppose, how... Yes. How did Reformed theology not depend from... 
okay, why did, why did the Reformation not have a broader, um, not have a broader influence? Is that kind of the question? Thanks, Cassidy. Thanks for coaching me through that. Um, I think it's very important to realize that, that there, there is definitely a, there's definitely some sort of cultural waves that are rippling through this dynamic. And what I mean by that is there's definitely some sort of cultural, cultural influences that's determining or influencing how, how and where and when the Reformation agenda works. I think there's at least three things that empower the Reformation. The first is the brute reality of the, the technology to, to make it work. And, and print media does have a lot to do with Reformation theology. Reformation theology is a theology that's oriented towards print media. So that means that icons and those sorts of things, uh, uh, visual representations of, the, of Christian truth, that's going to have a much smaller role in Reformation theology. And even things like, um, with the coming of print media comes this whole wave of vernacular translations. That, wouldn't re that huge intellectual project of translating the scripture from originals, from original Greek and Hebrew into various vernacular languages, that would not have been feasible, that could not have been powered, that sc scholarly project could not have been powered through these monastic communities, at least with the way they were conceiving of things and organizing them. So I think print media in one way does make that possible. And if you look at the Reformation agenda, it's very interesting for me to look at uh, some, of the, some of the most characteristic um, Elements of Reformation theology are developed by going past the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate tradition, and getting straight back into the original texts. Much of that Reformation agenda comes from that, justification by faith and, and, uh, and so on. <clears throat> so that's one empowering feature. And then conversely, um, where university culture does not develop as quickly or as widely, there might be less appeal to Reformation thought. But there's more to it than just that. Uh, also, why is it that all of these southern countries in Europe remain Catholic? It's really the northern countries that become Protestant. You can divide things up geographically as well as you can divide them up politically uh, or, or theologically. Well, it's these southern countries, um, what, for whatever reason, that are are going to be outside of the Holy Roman Empire. There is something to that, that the Holy Roman Empire allows the Reformation agenda to take root. These southern countries are going to be a little bit more monarchical. They're also going to be seafaring countries. So, and for whatever reason, they remain Catholic and they will spread Roman Catholicism with them as these European explorers from Portugal, Spain, Italy, and so on travel the whole world. So, as the Reformation is gaining in the north, it's, Roman Catholicism is making huge gains in the South and in the New World. Um, and actually, I'll stick with those two points. Good, thanks for that, Cassidy. Go ahead, Braden. Um, I don't know if what you're looking for because it goes back to the icon of Jesus. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, it depends on what side you want to be on, doesn't it, right? God is going to have to be the judge of that. Uh, because, and, and, and also the reason why I would refrain from personally judging it is because I, I think I recognize that it's cyclical. In any reforming context, any context where there's reform of any kind, there's, there's, uh, there's this complexity to it. Take as a microcosm in our day, how modern worship music has sort of swept evangelical churches. That used to be very controversial, right? I mean, I, in living, easy access living memory, uh, there was, um, you, I can report to you personally, the scandal that my parents and I might have felt when in the early 90s drums started coming into our church, okay? With even something like that, it's a type of reformation. 
it's really complex. There are good reasons why this might have been too fast for a, a certain segment of our population in our churches. And there's another reason why it might have been actually truly a profitable thing. God is gonna have to be the judge of those in every circumstance, and, and it just keeps going. Good, thanks Braden for that. Okay, I really appreciate you working with me. I'll give you uh, nine minutes of the remaining uh, of class period for your last break. Thank you so much for your uh, good questions, especially for our panel members as they were with us last hour. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>